Hi, I'm Brie Allison with the Power of the Patient Project, and welcome to our new segment, Tell Us Your Story. Today, we are joined by Dr. Marianne Miller. Dr. Miller is an expert eating disorder therapist and binge eating consultant who is currently serving the San Diego area. She has been a psychotherapist for 25 years and has been treating eating disorders for over 10 years. Dr. Miller provides therapy and specialized training in treating adults and teens who are struggling with their relationship with food and or body issues. She is a compassion for those who are struggling because she's been in their shoes as she has recovered from binge eating herself. Dr. Miller wants to help clients reclaim their mental and emotional energy by shifting their relationship with food to be fully present in their life. Dr. Miller, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. So to start off, can you talk about how somebody develops an eating disorder? Well, um, it, uh, 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 eating disorders are very complex and people can develop eating disorders by um, sometimes it's a, a pileup of stressors that um, happen in their lives. And um, what we've found, what researchers have found is that there's a big biological predisposition for eating disorders. Um, they've done uh, twin studies and found that you know, when they look at identical twins, up to 82% of the second identical twin has an eating disorder if the first one does. And so um, the way that I talk to my clients about it is, is that you have a biological predisposition, you often find the patterns um, occurring throughout the family tree, and some sort of stressors flip that biological switch, and then people start developing a preoccupation with food, eating, and body image um, to the point at which it becomes um, detrimental to their, at least their mental health and often their physical health. And those stressors can be, you know, um, intense traumas like car accidents or domestic violence or you know, sexual assault or something like that, or it can be going off to college and just dealing with the adjustments of that. Um, the pandemic was a huge, you know, uh, stressor that really saw a lot of um, people developing eating disorders. And so it was, it, it's, it's been very interesting and, and sad <laughs> and interesting the past few years just to see how many more people have suffered because of, you know, the lockdown and the pandemic and, and um, the stressors that that brought on people. Definitely. The pandemic was a hard time for a lot of people and yeah. a lot of people were alone. So I'm sure sometimes food was a comfort or you had a lot of time to sit with yourself and think about things. Yeah. And get on social media that was telling you that you needed to, go on these, you know, 30 day cleanses or <laughs> eat what they eat and mm -hmm. go into these extreme exercise regimes and become more obsessed about how you look. So it's like it was a perfect storm, really. Exactly. And what can you talk about, like some of the common eating disorders and what they can look like in everyday life? Yeah, so um, the OG eating disorder is anorexia. And I say OG because that was the first one that was diagnosed officially. Um, and that's very restrictive eating. Um, there are two types of anorexia. There's restrict anorexia that is very restrictive eating. Um, and sometimes there's an over-exercising component. And then there's a uh, a, a second type of anorexia called binge purge anorexia. So people are restricting and then they binge and they purge as well. Um, but the main component of it is restricting. And then the second um, uh, diagnosis that came about is bulimia. And that's uh, where people have a binge um, and they eat you know, either objectively or subjectively, a large amount of food, and then they end up um, vomiting it up, or uh, they do other kinds of compensatory behaviors, like take laxatives, or 
they take, um, uh, you know, they, they over exercise <laughs> to try to make up for the calories that they've eaten. And then uh, the third more recent uh, diagnosis that came out uh, in 2016 was binge eating disorders when people um, have these binge episodes and there's no compensatory uh, behaviors. Um, there are other subtypes of eating disorders, um, but in terms of like eating disorders that have to do with food, um, eating and body image, those are like the big three categories. And then there's, um, you know, there are people that don't meet all of the categories or any of the categories. And then uh, we we put them in kind of like a, a catch-all, <laughs> uh, <laughs> other specified feeding or eating disorders. Mm -hmm. I'm sure with each person, it's all a little different. So it's... yes, you're right. It is. Mm -hmm. So that can be hard to um, determine maybe sometimes what they have, or like you said, they're in the catch-all category. Yeah. Um, so what type of services are available to somebody who is looking for help with an eating disorder, or body image issues, and how do they take that first step? So um, that's a really good question. A lot of people do end up talking to their physicians um, when they're struggling with that. And unfortunately, um, medical providers are not educated in eating disorders. Um, I've, I've talked to and worked with, uh, collaborated with many medical providers who says, who have told me uh, we don't get any training on this at all. Um, wow. And so, and, and often they're kind of the first point of contact, whether it's kind of the pediatrician, if it's a teen or child, or you know the family practitioner um, or uh, primary care provider, and sometimes the advice. Actually, it's more often than not the advice that my clients get are um, very much embedded in what we call diet culture, and so um, there's there's this belief that. Um, what weight is an indicative um, of health. And that is, I could spend a lot of time unpacking that. So like a person's weight and body size, um, you know, determines how healthy they are. And so people can, uh, medical providers can jump to a lot of conclusions on how healthy or unhealthy a person is based on how they look. And so, um, so often my clients have gotten some really, really terrible advice and felt very shamed by medical providers, felt very, um, uh, you know, uh, judged and, um, well, you should just learn how to eat right. Or, you know, you should just start eating if they're more on the anorexic side and, or just giving them some really weird, you know, pop, I call it pop culture diets, but like try, <laughs> try, and, and, and it's, it's really, really hard. And so sometimes it can be months of that until a client finally does some searching online and reaches out to someone like me. I mean, I think um, social media has been a blessing and a curse um, in the younger generation, they're more aware of eating disorders because people are talking about it on social media. But also, I think what's happening on social media is there's also a perpetuating um, process of eating disorders because of um, diet, fitness and wellness um, influencers who uh, embrace that diet culture mentality with the notion of thinner is always better. So, um, so in terms of how people can reach out for help, and um, there are some great resources online, the NIDA, the National Eating Disorders Association has, a, is an excellent resource uh, website. Um, uh, Feast, F-E-A-S-T is a, also a really good resource. Um, for family members of people with eating disorders. 
So those are good places to start. And, and then if, you know, at, at the very least, they could just say eating disorder professional near me. Um, the important thing, though, is they want to find someone who specializes in eating disorders because there are some therapists and dietitians who say, yeah, I treat eating disorders. And uh, it really, that's just kind of one of like this long list of things that they treat. They're really not a specialist. And it takes, uh, you know, as therapists, I got zero training on eating disorders <laughs> in my, you know, seven and a half years of graduate school. And so I, um, I had to get so much extra training and experienced and supervised experience outside of my regular training, uh, you know, education and licensure. And so now, you know, 99% of my clients have eating disorders. And that's what I've been doing for 10 years. And so you want to find someone where at least 75% of their clientele has eating disorders. Um, and it's, it, you need to find a specialist because it's a very, very complex because, because there's a psychological, there's a physiological, and there's a nutritional component. And um, the best treatment is when you come with a, a team approach where you have a therapist um, an eating disorder dietitian, and then a um, medical provider that hopefully is a little bit more educated on eating disorders. Um, I know I'm giving a, a long answer, um, but I, this is really important information I wanted to convey so you can edit it however you want. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, everything you said was great. And I had no idea that like doctors and physicians weren't didn't really have any training in eating disorders. No, no and, and so unfortunately they bring their own biases um, against, uh, you know, their their biases ag against people of different sizes. And, um, you know, there's racial components, um, you know, racism that comes into play with that. It's really, it's really terrible, unfortunately. Yeah, that is very sad. And so when a client gets to you, if they reach out to you, how do you proceed from there? Like what's kind of the process? Sure. Um, well, I talk to them on the phone first uh, to determine whether they're stable enough for outpatient care. Uh, because if some people uh, are not medically stable, they need to go to a higher level of care. And there's sev several layers of higher levels of care. So, um, so I'm at the outpatient level. The second level up is an intensive outpatient treatment where people sleep at home, but it's like four to six hours a day, like three to four days a week where they meet with the, you know, dietitian and they have group sessions and the therapists there. And then above that is a partial hospitalization program where it's it can be anywhere from eight to 12 hours a day, five to six days a week, and then they go home and sleep. It's very intensive, individual therapy group. They're seeing psychiatrists, physicians, and everything. And then we have residential treatments where people go and live. It's typically in like a big house um, and uh, to get medically stabilized and they have group therapy and they get all their meals. They get meals too with the other higher levels of care um, and uh, eat, eat together. So to make sure that they're getting fed. And then if people are very severe, um, then they are hospitalized um, and they need to be stabilized first at the hospital level and then kind of go throughout the levels until they're stable enough to um, see me as an outpatient therapist. So I have calls for some people um, where I send them straight to medical providers who I know are, um, you know, trained in eating disorders and the medical provider sends them straight to the hospital. And so again, it's very important for eating disorder professionals to have this knowledge and to be able to coordinate care with um, physicians and dietitians, and I, you know, I'm communicating with them every every day. 
um, because we do that at, at, at every level. So. I didn't realize there were so many different options too, yeah. like levels of that care. Yeah, it can be, it can be confusing. And that's why, you know, the, those websites, uh, the National Eating Disorder Association and Feast is a good one. I mean, my website, um, drmarianmiller.com, I have a blog on eating disorder resources, and I talk about a lot of uh, the different levels of care there as well. So, um, but there's, yeah, it's, it, it's a lot, and it can be very confusing, um, especially for parents who are like, what is going on? I don't know what to do. My pediatrician is saying it's no big deal, but I think it is. I don't know. Um, so sometimes they call me and then I get them and pointed in the right direction. Um, so. Well, it's good that you're there to be that person of guidance for people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm happy. I'm happy to. And would you mind talking about your personal experience with eating disorders and kind of how you got past it? Yeah. Um, so this, I did not really, um, I kept, I, I kept my own eating disorder recovery story very much under wraps until um, early 2022 uh, because I, I wanted it to be about my clients and really focused on them. And I, I don't talk about my own recovery with my clients because that would be inappropriate because the focus needs to be on them. But I really decided to come be, go public with it um, earlier this year because I really wanted to give hope to people that they can recover from eating disorders because mine started early. It started elementary school. And um, I, I started uh, dieting and, you know, being very obsessed about food eating and body image. And when I was in um, uh, uh, middle school, that's where I was eating very restrictively. And um, like my period stopped. Uh, I had all the symptoms of anorexia, but I didn't look like an anorexic. <laughs> and especially back then in the 80s, I mean, there was just, there were just wasn't the knowledge or the research on eating disorders. And, and I, you know, if you don't look like you have an eating disorder, you don't have an eating disorder. I didn't have like a typical body type um, that uh, would look very, very um, underweight. Um, mm -hmm. And so, but at looking back and thinking about how many calories I was eating in a day, it was incredibly restrictive to the point where my period uh, even stopped, which is a, a symptom of anorexia. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it got to the point where when I was in um, high school and I got my driver's license, I was, uh, I had a lot more freedom. And so I went from kind of more restrictive type of eating disorder to where I, I was in a, 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 what's called a binge restrict cycle. And so you restrict for a while and then your, your body and your brain can't handle it anymore. You, your, the glucose deficit builds up so much and the psychological deprivation builds up so much that you end up moving forward and and just needing to binge your body and your mind uh it, it's like trying to stop a mac truck going downhill on an icy road with no brakes you know you just have to binge and so you know with me uh there wasn't a lot of uh food that i could binge on in my home environment and so, uh, so I would drive and get places and then hide food and go up and, and binge. Um, and so I was on that restrict binge cycle for many years um, until I was in college. And we had a guest speaker uh, who had written a book on an eating disorder. And she gave this talk. And I was like, oh my gosh, I think I have an eating disorder. And so I, I started reaching out for help. But again, this is the early 90s. There just was not that much help available. And so 
uh, you know, I got it at s someone who said she was an eating disorder therapist, but looking back, like she really didn't know much about eating disorders. And a lot of people didn't know much about eating disorders <laughs> back then. So, um, so what happened was, is that uh, I started, uh, I decided I wanted to get healthy and I stopped going to therapy. I'm like, it's fine. I'm recovered. And I started over exercising uh, because I, I was in a lot of like personal life transitions and I was feeling very anxious and I was like, well, I'll exercise to help with anxiety. And that became what I became obsessed with. So I would, um, I, I wasn't binging too much, but I was over exercising to compensate for anything that I was eating. And then I did that for several years throughout graduate school until like a month after I got my PhD, um, I injured my back because I was <laughs> over exercising so much. And I lo no longer had that as a coping skill to deal with my anxiety and to deal with my anxiety about food e eating and body image. And so then I started leaning heavily into the binge eating because I also had chronic pain develop from the over exercising. And that's actually quite common for people with eating disorders to develop some type of chronic pain or injury, sometimes even a chronic illness as um, as a result of years and years of you know having an eating disorder. I mean, for me, it was over two decades, 25 years or something like that. And so finally, um, I got a professor position at a university in San Diego. And then I had a side private practice as a therapist. And I was able to find someone who really specialized in eating <laughs> disorders, like actually really. <laughs> and uh, she helped me recover. And it was it was a long, hard road. And I had to really look at a lot of things and um, change behaviors and go deep. And, uh, you know, I was in a support group for a couple of years. And uh, finally, I got to the point where I was am completely recovered. And when I look back at my time in graduate school, I think about how I thought I was healed and recovered. And I was just healthy. Uh, and, and I completely wasn't because I would go to dinner with, uh, you know, my fiance and then husband, because I got married in my PhD program. And, he, and I would just be obsessing, even though I would be going to my favorite restaurant. Um, and instead of being able to enjoy my time with him and enjoy my time um, together, uh, and at this wonderful restaurant that was my favorite, I was obsessed about food, eating, and body image. I was calculating the calories. I was so worried because you know, that back then they didn't have the calories listed on all of these restaurants. The and and so I was like, oh, is this okay to eat? I don't know, you know. Uh, well, I did exercise earlier today. Is this all right? And and I couldn't be fully present in the moment, enjoying my time with him. So it really like the eating disorder hijacked my brain and hijacked my ability to be present in my relationships. And so what recovery has given me is the ability to be present in my relationships, the ability to, um, to really, uh, in interact and and live a full life and be be able to show up for people uh, in my life um, because I'm not thinking about that like I don't think about calories I you know I just I just don't think about that and um and so it, it I was amazed at when I recovered at how much mental energy I had you know, I had so much mental energy to be able to, to dive into helping people recover and um, start sharing my story, you know, this year, but, uh, but in the past, when I was recovered, I, I had so much mental energy to, um, you know, do fun things like live a life worth living. 
And, and that's what I want to convey to people that even if you have had uh, an eating disorder for decades, you can recover. It is possible. There is hope. And it, that is such an important message that I want people to have and hold on to. Like, even when it feels like everything is hopeless, I, I promise you that there is hope and that recovery is possible. Just getting the right help is absolutely key to that yes and we're so happy that you've recovered and you've regained yeah. your mental space um mm -hmm. to live a life happily and yes. we're happy that you shared your story because like you said you're providing hope for other people and your clients and that kind of leads into my next question um how does this personal experience with eating disorders help you in your career and relate to your clients well, I, I think I get the I get the obsessive nature of it. Um, uh, you know, it's you don't have obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, some people do. Some people have obsessive compulsive disorders and um, eating disorders. But for me, uh, there and for many people, there's just so many mental obsessions where you're fixated on food, eating and body image, and it just takes up so much time and space. And, and, you know, I, I, I want to, I'm a mover and a shaker. I want to get stuff done in my life, you know, <laughs> I want to, and, and, and so um, I really, I, I can show up with certainty with my clients that, I know that recovery is possible. I, a lot of eating disorder professionals call this radical hope. Like I can show up with that. Like people, even some of my clients have gone from therapist to therapist to treatment team to treatment centers and, and things like that. And therapists who have had, or clients who have had eating disorders for decades. And I can say you can recover and with certainty. And it's not only because I have, because I've seen many people and I've worked with many people who have as well. And so I, I, you know, it's, it's such a hard life and I can, I can empathize with people because I know because I lived it <laughs> for over two decades, it is really a hard life to have an eating disorder and it is, it's really terrible and it is possible to um, reclaim your brain and reclaim your life and live a life free of that it is possible and so that's what I do when I show up every day for my clients is that even though I'm not talking about my own recovery because I you know it's not about me and you know I need to focus on them I I show up with that hope with that presence and and that's what they need to hear because it, it's hard to feel that when you're in the middle of it mm -hmm. and you can I'm sure relate to them on like a deeper level because like you said, you know what they're going through, exactly what they're going through, because you've been there. Um, so I'm sure that definitely creates like a better bond between you and your clients. Yeah, yeah, I would say that. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know exactly because I'm not them and everyone's path and journey is different. So I need to make sure and not make assumptions that that what I went through is exactly what they went through. So you know, especially because, you know, I am, uh, I have white privilege, I have cisgendered um, privilege, um, I, I'm straight, um, you know, I have a lot of privilege, and a lot of my clients uh, don't have similar privilege. And so, uh, so their experience and the kind of things that they've gone through have, are different. And so it's in important, very important for me to um, honor their experience and have them uh, really talk about how racism has come into play, how uh, homophobia, how, um, you know, other kinds of uh, oppress oppressions and, you know, if they come from an, a historically oppressed or marginalized group, because that, that affects not only their interactions in daily life, it also affects their um, medical care. And that's been researched very well. 
um, and that uh, you know racism is a big part of uh, how it it really gets in the way of people getting adequate medical care. So if you have someone who is um, a, a black indigenous person of color who who comes to a medical provider who also is in a larger body and is restricting food um, and is undernourished, you know, medical providers uh, uh, may have a hard time seeing past all of the stereotypes and make, might make assumptions like, oh, you know, this person just has diabetes or they're just not, you know, trying hard enough or things, things like that. I can't even tell you, and, and I, I'm not a Black Indigenous person of color either. So it's it's uh, the stereotype, I think, is much worse um, uh, for historically impressed and marginalized people. But I can't tell you how many times people have assumed that I have diabetes, you know, because I'm in a larger body. <laughs> I'm like, I don't have diabetes. Like, I oh don't, no, still don't, five years <laughs> later, still don't have diabetes. <laughs> no, really, and because there's a lot of people in thin bodies who have diabetes, <laughs> so it's just it's just really crazy. So uh, to circle back to your question, it's very very important to to for me to honor the the story and the unique story and journey uh, that each person has, and and look at how that is weaves into their um, eating disorder. Uh, narrative and so um because it again the complexity it, is very important for me to attend to and so if i don't do that then i'm not doing a, an ethical work so mm -hmm. um yeah so that's it's, it's really really important yeah having somebody that will listen to them full-heartedly yeah and, uh... I feel like that's a big thing in the medical field that we need more of. Um, yes, certainly. And so what ways are people who don't have eating disorders able to support somebody who is struggling with an eating disorder or body image issues? Um, it's tricky. Uh, it's, it's tricky. Um, I think the number one thing is just to share with people that they are, they're there for them. Uh, that they're concerned um, and that they're there for help. Um, if, if it's a child um, and you're a parent, um, take the kid to a pediatrician. And, um, you know, if you feel like the pediatrician is dismissive, take seek a second opinion, seek a third opinion, um, look, may, look for someone who maybe is a little bit more eating disorder savvy. Um, uh, I think starting at the National Eating Disorders Association's website or the, the feast, it's feast-ed.org uh, website is really, really helpful because it, it helps them um, it helps them, gives them information and knows what uh, it helps. It teaches them on what questions to ask. Um, and medical stability is like the number one priority. Um, so, uh, so if, again, if you're, if it's the person is a minor, like drag them kicking and screaming to a medical provider and have them do, you know, vitals check and run the labs and everything. That doesn't always tell all the picture, but at least it gives you, you know, if, if their heart rate is below 40, like they need to be hospitalized. Although I have had some pr medical providers dismiss that and say, oh, it's just you're just because you're a runner, your heart rate's low. No, low, it's because they have anorexia and they need to be hospitalized immediately. So, so um, trust, so for parents, guardians, uh, trust your gut. If you feel like uh, something is wrong, if it looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, it talks like a duck, it's probably a duck. And if the medical provider says it's not, then seek second and third, fourth opinions. 
Um, and then for adults, uh, it's trickier because you can't force someone to get help. Um, so I think just by showing up and saying, I'm just concerned about you and I, I'm here for you and uh, do not make any comments about their body or their weight, like it, in either direction, whether you're worried about weight gain or weight loss, just don't even go there because that will be very painful and very triggering and that will likely shut them down. Instead, just say, you know, you just don't seem like yourself and um, you know, you seem a little bit more isolated because that's a, uh, isolation is a, a symptom of eating disorders and you just seem like you don't have much energy and, you know, I, I, I'm really worried about you. Is there anything I can do to help? Um, and it may take you saying that multiple times before they open up because there's a lot of shame that's associated with eating disorders and, um, and it's a, a lot of thinking that other people won't understand because a lot of people don't. <laughs> and so, uh, so just by saying I, I am here and no matter what you say, I'm not going to judge you. And I just want to help you because I care about you because I love you. Definitely being that support person for them in this time is um, very important. Yes, for sure. And the last question, what advice do you have for those who are struggling with their body image and or an eating disorder? Um, seek out help. Um, it, one thing I did not mention earlier when I was talking about levels of care is a, a coach. Um, if you feel like maybe you don't meet the criteria for a full-blown eating disorder, and you're just struggling with some general like emotional eating and body image issues, having a coach um, can be helpful, just kind of get you over the hump uh, to where you can let go of, of these things. Um, and that's what I provide. Uh, you know, I, pro I, I'm an eating disorder therapist in the state of California. And then internationally, I'm a binge eating coach and I have a a three months uh, virtual co uh, coaching plus an online course uh, program that people can uh, get into. And, and sometimes people feel hesitant to uh, seek a therapist. Maybe they've never been to therapy. Maybe they had a bad experience with a therapist. So sometimes that's a good place to start, but I, I, I would not accept anyone in my program who's not medically stable. And, um, and uh, one thing that I offer in my program is that I am, you know, a full-fledged eating disorder therapist. I'm not just someone who was, you know, trained as a binge eating coach. You know, I, uh, so I know what I'm doing and I know what uh, risk factors to look for to, if I need to send people out to a therapist or out to a higher level of care. Um, but so that is an option. Um, and I, I think that, um, there is a lot of good information on, um, social media. If you're following eating disorder therapists or dietitians or what they call like a non-diet dietitians or weight inclusive dietitians, um, and you know, they can follow me, Dr. Marianne Miller and, like look at the people that I highlight on, on Instagram. And um, I even have a group on Facebook um, uh, that they can uh, look up and I can provide you the, the link for that as well. Um, so, and I provide a lot of good um, resources, but also just by looking online, um, I think that that is a, a really good way for them to, to, find uh, eating disorder specialists by just saying eating disorder specialist or eating disorder therapist near me mm -hmm. <laughs> and looking up there and then asking them the questions like how many, what percentage of people do you, of, of, of uh, your clientele have eating disorders and it needs to be 75 or older. 
or, uh, or higher? How, how many years have you had? What extra training have you had in eating disorders? Just to make sure that they really know what they're talking about, because there, it can be very uh, dangerous if you get a therapist who is, says they treat an eating disorder, but hasn't been trained to treat an eating disorder. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, good. I kind of, kind of went around and gave some tangents, but I just want to make sure I covered no, it. You're good. That was yeah. all great advice. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> and that concludes our interview for today. Again, Dr. Okay. Miller, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your story. Oh, and it's my pleasure. <laughs> thank you for uh, giving hope and guidance to those struggling with eating disorders and body issues. Um, it's truly evident how much you care about your work and the compassion that you hold for each one of your patients. Um, and if you or someone you know is struggling with an eating disorder or body image issues, please make sure to take the first step and get help. And if you're interested in telling your story with us, please reach out with your name and email address to set up an interview. Email me at powerofpatient at gmail.com. I'm Bri Allison for the Power of the Patient Project, the National Library of Patient Rights and Advocacy. Thank you for watching.